Our story begins in the Superpower Academy, where our protagonist, Ning Feng, is laughingly playing games on his phone while walking. He was engrossed in an online game when someone launched a palm strike at him, slapping him hard on the face. Wang Yu asks him what he was doing and reminds him that the awakening exam is about to happen. Instead of preparing, he was playing games. He laughingly asks her if it isn't a combination of work and rest. He then tells her that he is already 18 years old and, at most, he'll awaken into a one or two star ordinary profession. He then leans towards her and tells her that he is not unlike her, who awakened a five star profession at 16, and asks her why he should work so hard if he can just rely on her coattails in the future, making her pissed. She then grabs him by the neck while shouting that she'll let him rely on her. While he was choking, the men notice Wang Yu and think that she must have returned from special training. Also, their province hasn't produced such a genius as Wang Yu in many years. Wang Yu's gap between people is too wide because she is beautiful, wealthy, and talented. Then they notice him trying to take his phone back, making the men wonder who he was. One of them answers that it was Ning Feng, the infamous trash of the school because he was about to turn 18, but still hasn't awakened. Wang Yu dragged him by the ears while the men, clearly irritated, ask how someone like goddess Wang Yu, a nice beauty, could hang out with such a person. One of the men replied that he heard they had been childhood friends but wondered how someone like that could match up with a childhood friend like Wang Yu when he was from an orphanage. Blue Star is a world where games and reality merge, and as long as they are over 16, they have the chance to awaken their abilities and become adventurers. Someone then tells the students that the next awakening miracle could be them. Ning Feng was waiting in line, wondering what was up with Wang Yu because she was being so serious again when it was his third time taking the exam, and he was not a rookie. The instructor tells them that the students called to the front should go to the testing area for assessment, and that the students who successfully awaken will receive a set of basic equipment for their profession. They should also prepare for practical testing. The students begin to chat about what they want to get when the instructor calls his name. He walks to the front while the students teasingly ask if he isn't the senior from grade 3 and whisper that he always follows goddess Wang Yu, thinking he is so powerful, yet he hasn't awakened at 18. He then approached the teacher named Kai Wai, and with a smile, she told him not to be nervous. She ordered him to place his hand on the crystal and relax his mind, which he followed. Once settled, he waited without expecting anything to happen but was shocked when the crystal lit up, leaving everyone stunned and surprised along with him. He thought he must be able to awaken because the crystal reacted to him, and he knew that the blue light represented the magic system. The students began to laugh at him, but he didn't care, knowing that awakening would automatically teach him initial skills. He decided to see how many stars of the profession he could awaken. The crystals then released different colors, and he was shocked to see the system show him that he had awakened a one-star profession, and learned a skill, the mud marsh technique. Kai Wai thought it was a pity for him to get only one star, and the students began to laugh at him. They teasingly told him to hurry down because standing there was embarrassing, and that garbage is garbage. Kai Wai asked him what skill he had awakened, and when he didn't answer, Kai Wai called him again, catching his attention and he looked back at her, confused. She thought he seemed to have suffered a big blow from his looks, and after all that silence, in the end, he was still just one star. She then gave him his equipment and ordered him to change into it and move to the next stage. He walked away, wondering if he had really not misheard, and remembered the system telling him that his awakening was complete and he had gained passive abilities, dark kinship and mystery gift. The system also explained to him that the passive skill, dark kinship, means he would not suffer a backlash from dark power and could use forbidden spells without any cost. The passive skill, Mystery Gift, meant he could release forbidden spells once a week without consumption, making him wonder if the dark power was the most evil power in that world and if forbidden spells were the highest level of magic. But then, the system told him that he got the Mud Marsh technique and it was beginning transformation, making him wonder what transformation meant and what it was. The system just told him that the transformation was complete, so the Mud Marsh technique transformed into the forbidden curse, Foul Earth Shell, leaving him stunned and confused about what was going on. He thought that darkening and forbidden spells didn't sound good and knew that he still had the practical test, so he hoped nothing would go wrong. Later, the instructor told them that 50 people would enter in groups, each battling monsters in the realm to familiarize themselves with their newly awakened skills. Candidates were not allowed to form teams or attack each other, and unmanned drones would supervise. Kai Wai told everyone to confirm their skills as soon as possible and they shouldn't worry because others wouldn't see them. The system then showed him that his active skill was Foul Earth Shell, a dark forbidden spell that summons dark power from another world to form a protective shield and was also capable of crushing all approaching enemies. He knows that those words sound very dangerous, making him wonder if it was some evil spell. He thinks he'll be in trouble if someone finds out about his skill. The instructor then ordered them to enter the arena, which they all followed, while he was shouting to the system in panic for an explanation. 
He then enters the portal and comes out in a sunny forest. The students begin to use their new skills to defeat the goblins inside. While the others are busy fighting with the goblins, he is busy hiding in the bush. When a goblin walks near him, he immediately hides. He was busy thinking that the entire exam venue was monitored by drones, so he dared not use those forbidden spells casually. But knowing that he didn't have any other means of attack, he decided to hide and wait for an opportunity, not noticing the drone flying above him. A man who saw him hiding angrily said that everyone else was leveling up by killing and asked what he was doing. Kai Wai called the man Captain Zhu and explained that Ning Feng awakened relatively late and wasn't in good health. Also, the only activated skill he possesses is a defensive spell, not very suitable for solo combat. Captain Zhu tells her to call Ning Feng out because there is no need for him to continue the exam. After all, with just a one-star profession, he can't become a real adventurer. But then, the monitoring man makes a confused sound, making Captain Zhu look back at the monitor and ask what is going on. The man replies that he doesn't know, but it seems like the drone was attacked and then the feed was cut off. The man then shouts an alert to everyone and reports that unusually high power fluctuations were detected in the realm, making Captain Zhu panic and order his men to investigate in a hurry and find out what is happening. On the other hand, inside the arena, the drone was destroyed into pieces while the man was on the ground, shaking in fear and asking how there could be such powerful monsters in the exam venue while looking at the huge goblin with sharp blades in hand. The goblin orders his brethren to rise and not to be enslaved any longer. He then orders the goblins to let those invaders die there, which the goblins agree to. The drone flew closer to the goblins, but the leader attacked it with his power, making it explode and fall into a nearby bush. Ning Feng, hit in the head, wondered why the drone fell, but then he was shocked to see a swarm of goblins surrounding him. The leader goblin laughingly said that there was actually a little bug there. A few goblins dashed toward him to attack while he wondered why so many monsters were gathering and guessed that the one in the middle seemed to be an elite leader. He then realized that the drone was gone and thinks that this was a great opportunity to test if the forbidden spell was real. He raised his hand and a purple power emanated from him. The goblin leader was shocked to see an undead rising from underground. On the other hand, at the station, a man shouted that all the screens had lost connection and suddenly, a leakage of dark power occurred in the realms, suspected to be from a king level or above monster. Captain Zhu ordered his men to call for reinforcements immediately and evacuate all non-combatants nearby. Kai Wai knew that a king level or above monster was a disaster capable of destroying a city and wondered why such a terrifying presence would be in the exam venue. Back in the arena, the goblin leader was sweating in horror and fear upon seeing his power, but Ning Feng simply released his undead to attack the goblins. He was amazed to see the forbidden spells in action, thinking they were kind of gross and sticky looking, which scared him. As his undead killed the goblins one by one, the system informed him that he had killed a goblin minion, gaining 10 experience and continuously gaining more experience points for every goblin killed. The goblin leader was shocked by the powerful darkness and asked if he was not human and how this was possible. Then, realizing his movements were slowing down, the leader shouted not to come any closer, but the undead just wrapped around it and killed it. The system then informed him that he had killed the goblin vanguard and gained 6,000 experience. A moment later, the system displayed his character information. His occupation was a mage, his level was 10, health was 10, strength was 8, agility was 8, spirit was 20, and his experience was 12. He was amazed to have gained 10 levels in one go, knowing that in previous year's practical tests, participants could only level up by one or two levels at most. He thought the experience points from the small monsters were all very low, mainly relying on the elite monster from earlier, and wondered how there could be elite monsters appearing in the exam venue. But then, an item lit up in front of him, making him realize it was the loot dropped by the elite monster, and he noticed that both items were of orange quality. He grabbed the Vanguard Mark, a consumable item of orange quality, which gave him a permanent plus 10 agility attribute. Then, there was the Shadow Butcher's Claw, also of orange quality, with a requirement level of 20. It provided plus 13 strength, plus 16 agility, plus 10% attack speed, plus 5% critical hit rate, and a 10% chance to trigger a combo, and it could be inlaid with up to 3 enhancements. He knew that orange quality was already considered epic level treasure, which meant they were definitely very valuable. And although he couldn't use the claw now, orange equipment could still sell for a lot of money. Excited at the thought of easily leveling up by killing monsters and finally getting rich. He was then startled when the captain ordered everyone to immediately abandon the test and use the teleport scroll to evacuate, making him wonder what was happening. 
Suddenly, he felt a strong power spreading around him, and when he peeked back, he was shocked to see holes in the ground, making him question why it was so desolate there, if it was the power of the forbidden curse, and if they were all traps. He immediately opened his scroll, knowing it would be terrible if someone found out, so he must run away. The other students used their scrolls to leave the arena too. Captain Zhu shouted to everyone not to stay there and to leave immediately to return to the city. Zhu clenched his teeth, thinking that even if everyone present teamed up, they wouldn't be able to resist a king level or above monster and he didn't know if reinforcements would make it in time. But Zhu was shocked to realize that the source of the dark power suddenly disappeared, fearfully wondering if that demon had escaped outside the realm. When he came out from the arena, he saw Kai Wai telling someone that it was already beyond what they could handle, so she'd report immediately, and everyone had to remain silent to avoid large-scale chaos. She also ordered the activation of the school's ceiling array, leaving only one exit for unrelated personnel to evacuate quickly. He called out to Kai Wai to ask, but she worriedly asked if he was okay. He replied that he was fine, and she ordered him to leave in a hurry, telling him that the school was temporarily suspended, so he shouldn't come back unless necessary. Later, he asks Wang Yu what is going on because it seems like their teacher, Kai Wai, is facing a formidable enemy. She replies that she heard an unknown power source was detected in the exam venue and that the whole school had been sealed off. He wonders if it could be the unidentified elite monster and thinks about how hard it was for him to endure until awakening, only for the test to be interrupted halfway. Wang Yu notices his disappointment and thinks that the incident has hit him hard. She then tells him that defensive spells can save his life, but they are not suitable for leveling alone, and starting tomorrow, he'll team up with them. He thanked her for her kindness but told her that it was not necessary because he can level up on his own. He proudly thinks that it's not that he doesn't want to, but he only knows the dark forbidden spells, so he can't casually use them in front of others, while Wang Yu looks at him, confused. She then shouts to him that no refusal is allowed, and tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, at the west gate, she'll be waiting for him. He tried to stop her, but she just walks away, leaving him frustrated and shouting, asking why she won't listen to him. He also shouts that Wang Yu is so autocratic, but he calms down, knowing that it was bad and wonders if he should fake being sick. He then realizes that it won't work because, with Wang Yu's personality, he can't avoid her indefinitely. He then thinks of a plan and wonders if it'll work. Later, he arrives at Yuan Cheng Exchange, aware that some equipment comes with skills attached. He plans to buy an item with a Meyer spell attached and pretend to use it tomorrow. He walks into the store, hoping that the system won't turn the equipment's skill into a forbidden spell, and thinks about selling the loot from earlier monster fights. A pretty lady asks him how she may assist him, and he replies that he'd like to purchase an item with the Meyer spell attached, whether it's a weapon, clothing, or accessory. She asks him if he is a newly awakened student and tells him that there is no need to specifically buy a low-level spell like the Meyer spell because they have many items with high-level spells attached, more suitable for leveling up. She offers to show him some, but he replies that there is no need for it because he just needs it temporarily, so the equipment level doesn't need to be too high. The lady then calls someone to assist him and walks away, remarking that after all, he was a penniless person and she was not going to bother serving him, so he should let the newcomer handle him, leaving him confused. Then, another lady asks him how she can assist him, and he replies the same. The lady showed him the equipment. He tried the gloves, armor, and a sword that he couldn't lift but in the end, he settled for a ring. The lady asked him if he was satisfied with that ring, and he replied that it was fine. He then thanked the lady for accompanying him to so many stores and asked where he could sell loot. The lady took him to the appraisal consignment room. The man inside invited them in, and the lady informed the man, Wang, that he wanted to sell loot. He showed the armor, asking if Wang could help them evaluate it and how much it could be sold for. Wang saw that it was an agility-based orange weapon with low-level requirements, boasting excellent attributes, very suitable for newcomers, and it also came with three gem slots, allowing for adjustments according to needs to achieve more suitable effects. Wang told him that it was a good item and they should have several clients interested in that equipment. Wang then asked him if he had any specific requirements for its price, and he replied that the higher the price, the better. Wang said he understood and asked him to wait a moment because he would make a phone call to contact the clients. Wang then called Lady Yang to tell her that Ning Feng was her guest, so she should take care of him, which she agreed to. Wang called someone named Jiang to ask if he was still looking to find a fine piece of equipment for his son and mentioned that he happened to have one there, while Yang was pouring him tea on the side. After the call, Wang informs him that the equipment has been sold and the buyer is willing to pay 50,000 crystals. However, after deducting an 8% transaction fee, 
he will receive 46,000 crystals. This revelation shocks Ning Feng, and Yang stares at him in disbelief too. A moment later, Wang mentions that if he completes the formalities there, they'll transfer the money to his account immediately. Ning Feng replies that it was quick and he was just thinking about buying a few more pieces of equipment. Wang assures him that he'll recommend some shortly, guaranteeing his satisfaction. Outside the room, another lady asks the pretty lady from earlier if she didn't mention that she likes handsome guys the most and questions why she let that young man go. The pretty lady responds that she only likes rich and powerful handsome guys, implying that poor guys are not even worthy of carrying her shoes. Then, seeing him emerge with Wang and Yang, they question the pretty lady about why her client is now with Master Wang. The other lady reveals she heard that the handsome guy sold equipment for 50,000 crystal coins and was now choosing another piece of equipment, leaving them shocked to learn that it was more than three months' worth of their salary just in commission. The pretty lady is stunned and exclaims that it should have been her receiving him, so the commission should be hers. After his shopping, Yang tells him to take care and mentions that next time he comes, he should just find her directly. She then introduces herself as Yang Xin. The next day, Ning Feng walks outside proudly with his new equipment, relieved that he tested the equipment last night and the spell it comes with won't be affected by the system, so he doesn't have to worry about exposure. He then happily calls Wang Yu, but then someone tells Wang Yu that they didn't expect to find her there. She sees a group in front of her, comprising a shield warrior, a mage, a great axe berserker, and a cleric. She introduces them to him as members of her guild, and two members smile at him, but the other two stare at him seriously, making him wonder what was wrong with those two because they looked like he owed them 80 million. The shield warrior tells Wang Yu that he remembers she was about to reach her second transformation, prompting her to ask the man what he meant by it. Ning Feng was amazed upon hearing this, knowing that transformations can only be completed once every 30 levels, which made him wonder if Wang Yu was almost level 60. This revelation made it clear why Wang Yu is considered a genius girl with a 5-star rating from the beginning. The man then replies that it was nothing much, he just wanted to give her a gift. He gave her an advanced agility potion that was consumable, of orange quality, and it permanently increased the agility attribute by plus 3. The berserker man exclaimed that it was an advanced potion that permanently increases attributes. The cleric asked if she was right to assume it was expensive. The man replied that expensive wasn't a big deal because it cost only 20 to 30,000 crystal coins. However, both of them agreed that the key issue was that such high-level potions are hard to come by, even with money. His father had asked many friends for help and finally managed to obtain one. She thanked the man for his kindness but told him he could take the gift back. However, the man disagreed, emphasizing that the potion was very precious. He then asked her if she wasn't determined to get into the top university. She turned around, replying that there was no need for it, and they still had things to do, so they should go first. The man, visibly angry, pointed at Ning Feng and asked Wang Yu if she was really going to waste time on that kind of trash. She angrily called the man Zhao Cheng to warn him, but Cheng teasingly asked her what was wrong and remarked that a one star was just trash and they would never amount to anything in their life. Ning Feng wondered why Cheng was suddenly targeting him, who this guy was, if he was sick, and if he should just cast a forbidden spell on him to settle the matter. The cleric lady attempted to persuade Cheng that they should leave but he insisted she move aside, declaring it was none of her business. He vehemently told her that Ning Feng's entire body couldn't equate to the value of a single attribute potion, and that they should leave to avoid further embarrassment. However, he was calmly confronted by Ning Feng, who questioned if he was acting like a mad dog, biting people indiscriminately, and pointed out it was merely a plus three potion, yet he dared to boast so arrogantly. This made Cheng angrily retort, questioning what he had said and if he was seeking death. The mage then challenged Cheng, asking if he possessed anything more formidable to justify his attitude and why he wouldn't showcase it to them. Cheng, agreeing with his team, told him that as long as he could produce such an item, he would kneel and kowtow to him, but if he failed, he would perform the gesture instead. Upon releasing the item, he instructed Cheng to prepare himself and presented it to Wang Yu as a gift. Surprised, she discovered it was a pioneer badge, an orange item that permanently enhanced attributes. She inquired about the item, having never encountered it before. Cheng, stuttering, questioned how an item could permanently provide a plus 10 attribute boost and speculated it was a falsehood. However, he confidently suggested they test it to see for themselves. Wang Yu, initially hesitant, accepted the badge on his assurance that he had found it at his home and intended it for her. Her team urged her to utilize the badge immediately, unable to contain their anticipation. Upon using it, she excitedly confirmed the increase in attributes, astonishing the cleric lady. Meanwhile, Cheng and the mage man denied the possibility, accusing Ning Feng of theft. He reminded Cheng to kowtow audibly due to his purported hearing impairment. Cheng, defiant, refused, but when Meng Yu questioned his hesitation, he sought his team's support, only to find them departing. 
Left with no alternative, Cheng begrudgingly knelt and performed a loud kowtow. After that, he walked away while waving goodbye to everyone, telling them that he would see them later. Once they were far away, Wang Yu apologized to him, but he told her to stop, indicating that their relationship did not allow for apologies. Smiling, he told her that she really didn't need to accompany him because he preferred her to complete the second transformation and get into the best university. He also mentioned knowing that he couldn't level up with her around. She worriedly told him not to give up on himself, and he replied that he wasn't giving up. She then gave him something, which he saw were skill books. She explained that he could learn them once he reached the appropriate level. Noticing that they were all of purple quality, he asked if they were expensive. She replied that they cost not much money and were incomparable to the badge he had given her, so he told her he would accept them. Later, in a dangerous graveyard on the periphery of the secret realm, the undead lunged at them. Then, an arrow flew, hitting an undead in the head. He shouted that it was 666 and silently thought that the experience gain there was so low, but he couldn't tell Wang Yu that he had already reached level 10, making him wonder what he could do when he felt helpless too. But then, Wang Yu's phone rang, and she answered it. The cleric lady informed her that they had just received news that the big boss, the fallen necromancer, was about to appear, and such an opportunity was quite rare. The lady then asked her if she wanted to pursue it. She asks her if she was coming. Cheng interrupted them by asking, how else are we going to fight the boss if Wang Yu won't come? Tell her that the fallen law necromancer can drop rare mage items, which are very important to him. Wang Yu was silent upon hearing this and looked at him, who was telling her to go because it was okay. They were both in that secret realm anyway, so he could level up later. She agreed and told him to go to the safe zone and wait for her, which he excitedly agreed to. She then jumped and flew away while he was shouting to her to take care and come play often when she had time, making her shout back at him to shut up. When she was gone, he smiled, thinking that he was finally alone, and proudly said that the big boss was there today. He was glad that he had prepared early yesterday and learned two more skills since they could all be used for free once. The more forbidden spells, the better. The system then showed him the passive skill, Arcane Gift, that allows all his forbidden spells to be cast once a week without consumption. He stretched his arms disappointedly, thinking that he only has three skill slots at his current level, and he knew that he wouldn't be able to use the skill book Wang Yu provided for him until he reached level 15. He then looked at his three active skills and two passive skills. Meanwhile, in a perilous tomb, one of the men in the other team told his members that the big boss had appeared in the depths of the secret realm's high tower, and they needed to fight their way there from here. They should be careful because that dungeon is very difficult and the monsters inside are very dangerous. However, they were all shocked when a flaming power dashed past them. The lady told her team that there was already an adventurer team ahead, making the man stutteringly wonder how they were so far ahead. But the other men noticed that it was Wang Yu and Cheng from the Lion Guild, and told his team that even if they were put on a national scale, they were still extremely powerful newcomers. The other man agreed and told them that others didn't stand a chance while looking at the Lion Guild excitedly and easily killing monsters in the front. The cleric asked the Berserker man if he felt that Wang Yu had become even stronger, to which the Berserker man agreed and responded that, after all, Wang Yu's agility had increased by 10 points. Meanwhile, in the secret realm, within a perilous tomb deep, a forbidden black hole appeared, and he came out from it while excitedly saying that the forbidden spell of spatial magic, indeed fast, is called Void Step. It's a dark forbidden spell that tears through space into the dark world, swiftly traverses to the target location, and can last for one hour. A moment later, an eye hole appeared on the ground, and the boss of the perilous tomb deep came out from it, but he just calmly told it that it was late. It immediately launched a powerful attack at him, causing a loud explosion and leaving nothing but dust in his previous position. It furiously called him an arrogant adventurer and demanded to know how he dared to appear alone, thinking he had vanished. But then, he reappeared behind it using his spatial magic, replying that he didn't want to share the spoils with anyone else. He then activated his Meteor Rain skill, a dark forbidden spell that summoned a fierce rain of fire from the sky, causing massive area damage. The boss was shocked to see stones raining fire above it, striking every monster in the tower and causing a huge explosion. He immediately used his spatial magic to evacuate from the rain and saw the system showing him that he had killed a corpse demon, moon demon, erosion ghost, dark feast ghost, armor warrior, and true armor warrior, gaining 12 o experience points in total, 200 for each of them. The system then showed him that he had killed a fallen law necromancer, making him gain 50,000 experience points and reach level 30. He walked to the dropped items, knowing the spoils were abundant and that he could use the pendant and gemstones. Unfortunately, the two skill books were not exclusive to mages, still, they were worth a lot of money. He decided to absorb the necromancer emblem, thinking that even if it reduced stamina, he could accept it. 
After absorbing the Necromancer emblem, the system showed him that during transformation, he could unlock the hidden occupation, undead wizard, or activate the prerequisite tasks for the hidden occupation of all elemental mage. He smiled, knowing that hidden occupations are quite rare and innate, so there was no way to intervene, making him wonder if those emblems could be the key to activating hidden occupations. He then decided on his choice and shouted that they should not talk anymore because a real man should become an all-elemental mage. Meanwhile, his meteor rain spread to the perilous tomb where Wang Yu and her team were fighting. The berserker, panicking, asked what was wrong and shouted that it was a terrifying magic fluctuation. Wang Yu ordered everyone to stop advancing and retreat, but Cheng disagreed, wanting to kill the necromancer, which made her shout at him, asking if he wanted to endanger everyone when the situation was already so dangerous. Cheng clenched his teeth, thinking it was such bad luck. After retreating, she immediately grabbed her phone to inform Ning Feng, but she read that Ning Feng had messaged her that he had urgent matters and would leave first. Later, he arrived at the transformation hall and walked inside, noticing that not many people were there. He then saw the lady on the side, and the lady asked him if he was there to receive the transformation task, to which he replied, yes. The lady agreed and told him to let her register his information first. She then began to question him about his information, and he answered them. The lady couldn't believe he was undergoing transformation at 18 and noticed that his aptitude was a bit poor. She then stood up and told him to follow her to the mage transformation, which he agreed to. When they arrived at the mage transformation, the lady told him to just follow the process next, and then she would go out first, for which he thanked her. When the lady was out of the room, she saw someone and asked Captain Zhu if there was anything wrong. Zhu replied that they had just gone to investigate on site and the perilous tomb had suffered severe damage. Moreover, the source of power was not yet clear, but the estimated threat level might reach a king or higher. The lady asked Zhu if there had been two king-level threats in just two days, and Zhu confirmed it. He then told her that he was sent by the higher-ups, requesting Solitary Shadow to take action. On the other hand, in the transformation room, the system showed Ning Feng that his first transfer mission was to become a Lick Wizard, with conditions to enter the Realm of Illusion, Wu Mang Gui Tomb, and obtain the mission item, the Blood Soul Crown. The time limit is 3 days, and the difficulty is a level. The other option is the All-System Mage God, which is the first transfer mission prequel, with conditions to enter the Realm of Illusions, Huyang Divine Temple, and obtain the mission item, the Holy Emblem. The time limit is 3 days, and the difficulty is S level. He chooses the All-System Mage God, thinking that it is just a prequel mission. The system asks him to verify the relevant information again. After his mission is settled, he comes out of the room, thinking that it is truly worthy of a hidden profession. Even an S-level mission has appeared. He was glad that they gave him three days, so it was not too stressful for him. Another lady smiled and said goodbye to him, and he smiled and waved goodbye, but he noticed that it was not the lady from earlier. Meanwhile, in the perilous tomb, a man excitedly tells you that it is the first time he has seen a member of Solitary Shadow, and that their outfit is different. However, Ju tells the man to be quiet and responds that, after all, the existence of that organization is an official secret. Ju explained that it is said that members of Solitary Shadow all possess rare hidden professions that allow them to use the power of darkness in combat, specializing in executing special missions. The lady touched her head in pain and told everyone that it was such a powerful power of darkness that, even though it had dissipated a lot, it still affected her. She tells you that she didn't find any clues and it seems that the culprit disappeared after causing the damage, making it impossible to decide their purpose. Zhu tells her that recently, he has received reports frequently that some secret realms have shown unusual signs, which may be a prelude to some kind of crisis, and asks if there is any connection between them. She replied that it was hard to say and that she would consult with superiors and increase manpower. Zhu couldn't believe that even the famous solitary shadow, Quang Lan, found it troublesome. The man asks Quang Lan if the culprit is confined to a monster and if it could be others, but she asks the man back if he means if the culprit is a mutant like her, making the man apologize to her and explain that he didn't mean anything else. She calmly replies that the threat level there has exceeded the king level and to control such a huge power of darkness, the cost is not something that the human body can bear. The man asks if it means there is an exceptionally powerful monster hidden in the city which could bring about a catastrophe at any time, to which she agrees and replies that it is likely hiding in the dark and must be found as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the monster they were talking about was in his home, finding comfort in the dim environment. He sat on his bed, thinking that after reaching level 30, four more skill slots had been added. He decided to start by learning two books Wang Yu had given him. He then told the system that he wanted to learn a passive skill, Foul Earth Defense, and clicked on it. The system showed him that the passive skill, Foul Earth Defense, automatically takes effect when attacked, with damage 100% absorbed by the Foul Earth Shell, up to the limit of damage the Foul Earth Shell can inflict. 
Also, once the attack stops, the foul earth shell will gradually repair itself. He figured out that forbidden curses could also merge with lower level spells to generate new effects, and with this, he had another means of defense, making ordinary damage completely ineffective against him. He then opened the other book, and the system showed him that the detected skill, Falling Rock Technique, could merge with the Forbidden Curse's Foul Earth Shell and Meteor Fire Rain, and had been executed automatically. He then learned the passive skill, Elemental Mastery, Earth, and the system showed him that it could enhance all Earth-based spell effects by 20%. After reviewing his books and skills, he noticed that the skill slot count was still 4, so he decided to exchange and buy a few new books. Later, in the exchange tower, he walked inside, and the lady from before saw him, thinking it was the same as last time. She jumped in front of him sweetly, telling him she was there, but he simply told her that he was looking for Yang Xin. She flirtatiously responded that Yang Xin was with another client at the moment, so today she would accompany him. However, he just walked past her, telling her it wasn't necessary and he would just look around himself, leaving the lady frustrated and wondering if he was rejecting her like that and if she was not even comparable to someone like Yang Xin. She then followed him, telling him it was okay because it was her duty. Suddenly, Yang Xin ran to him and called out his name. He asked her if she was done, and she replied that she was not done yet, she was just eating in the back, but her colleague had told her he was there, so she hurried over. He apologized to her for interrupting her meal and offered to treat her later as compensation, making her reply that it was embarrassing. Meanwhile, the lady in the background was infuriated, thinking he was deliberately provoking her anger. A moment later, he pointed to the books and told Wang that he wanted to consign those two skill books for sale and also wanted to buy some more mage skill books. Wang replied that it was no problem and ordered Yang to accompany him, which she agreed to. Wang remembered that last time he sold an orange weapon, but this time it was purple skill books, making Wang interested in his background and deciding to send someone to find out more about him. Later, he and Yang were chatting in the restaurant. When they finished, he called the waiter for the bill, but Yang told him there was no need for it because she had already paid. Shocked, he asked her if they hadn't agreed that he would treat her, to which she replied that she had a reason to treat him and he shouldn't worry about it. He asked her what the reason was, but she playfully replied that it was a secret and they should go. When they were outside, he offered to walk her out, but she said there was no need to trouble himself because she was heading to another place and would just take a taxi. He agreed and told her to take care. When she entered the car, the driver asked her where they were going, and she replied to the city's second hospital. She smiled, thinking that thanks to Ning Feng, she earned a lot of commission and her father's medical expenses for that month were finally settled. As she was in tears of happiness, the car window shattered and something pierced the driver. She was horrified to see it. Outside their car, there was portal above and a lot of monsters was coming out from it causing chaos in the street. She immediately grabbed the car door handle and jumped out of the car. Thrown to the ground, she wondered what was going on and why monsters were appearing in the safe zone. Then, a monster appeared in front of her. Stunned, she saw a man coming out of the portal, who then smiled at her. She then attacked the monster with her power, but the monster didn't sustain even a scratch and simply screamed in anger. Yang Xin was a mage with a one-star attribute and was at level 34, but she noticed that her attack was futile. The monster then swung its claw to attack her, making her shout in fear. Fortunately, Captain Zhu appeared in time and decapitated the monster. He asked her if she was okay, and she replied that she was. He then told her that if she could move, she should find a place to hide first. She ran away, while Zhu noticed that everything around there had been corrupted and the secret realm had begun to merge with reality. He had never seen such a serious situation before. He then looked at the monster he had just killed and noticed that these monsters were not something a one-star ordinary person could handle, making him remember his colleague's words that an exceptionally powerful monster hidden in the city could bring about a catastrophe at any time. Suddenly, sharp fingers reached for him, but fortunately, he jumped away in time to dodge them. He asked the person who attacked him if he was a mutant, and the man replied that he was not that kind of trash because he was the guardian of the power of darkness. This made Zhu wonder what the man meant by a guardian, as he had never heard of it before, but he decided to set his curiosity aside, knowing that it was not the time to dwell on such things. He then swung his sword at the man, but the man merely punched his sword, throwing him away. He realized that his situation was not good because the man was at least at the level of a third transfer or higher. The man then put his finger on the ground, releasing his power and laughingly said that it was his territory. He then released a dark power around them, telling Zhu that a weakling like him was no match for him, and jumped at him to attack, thinking that no one was a match for him. The man pierced his sharp claws into him, and the force threw him away. The man laughingly shouted that he had really become stronger and that he felt a constant surge of power by stepping on that land. 
Suddenly, the man's skull pendant called the man a lowly human and told him not to indulge himself, making the man apologize. Someone in the crack in the sky reminded the man that his power was granted by him and that without him, he would be nothing more than a crawling creature in the dirt like his kind. An eye then appeared in the crack, and demons slowly came out of it. The demon ordered the man, who was kneeling on the ground and shaking in fear, to prove to him that he still had value and he should use the people in the city as sacrifices for his dominion over that world, which the man respectfully agreed to. Meanwhile, someone swung the curtain aside, and it was Ning Feng who emerged from a public restroom. He was shocked to see dead bodies outside and a monster, making him wonder what was going on and what had happened, since he had just come back to use the toilet. The monster then looked back at him and dashed to attack, but the ground in front of him cracked, and he simply attacked the monster with his earth spike wall. He was glad that he had spent a lot of money to buy that weapon today, which came with a purple skill and just happened to complement his death magic bonus. He then came out of the building and was shocked to see that the street was corrupted. He then saw someone dragging a dead body, and the man threw the dead body aside when he saw Ning Feng, annoyed that there were still some overlooked insects. The man then jumped and launched his sharp claws at him, taking Ning Feng by surprise. The man successfully grabbed him, but was shocked to see Ning Feng releasing a shield, making his powerful arm shake. The man stutteringly asked how Ning Feng could block his attack, and the demon told the man that it was indeed a power of darkness. The demon also told the man that Ning Feng's power far exceeded his, but then corrected himself, stating that he sensed a more terrifying aura than death from Ning Feng. With his eyes closed, Ning Feng thought the man seemed very strong and wondered if the man could be planning to cast a forbidden curse on the city. He then opened his eyes and shattered the man's sharp crystal arm, leaving the man in disbelief and shouting for his leader demon. However, the demon simply told the man that the user he was trying to reach was out of service, so he should deal with it himself. The demons then flew up to the sky and rushed back to the crack, with the leader demon telling the demons to hurry back because they were closing. Eventually, the crack closed, and the man who was left asked what was happening and how his power disappeared. Ning Feng just smiled at the man. The so-called mutants are those who, during the awakening process, gain the hidden profession of darkness. They can wield the power of darkness, which makes them stronger than ordinary professions of the same level. However, once they lose the protection of the power of darkness, they become vulnerable. The man screams, as his body pierced with an earth spike, killing him instantly. Ning Feng knows that the man could be quite troublesome but is relieved that he can focus on offense without worrying about defense. He then decides to quickly pick up the spoils on the ground and hurry home before anyone notices him. A moment later, in the destroyed city, Quang Lan and a lady appear. The lady informs Quang Lan that the monster has retreated and the invasion from the realm has ceased. She notices that two destructive spells, one being the intrusion of the realm into reality, both appear and disappear suddenly, leaving her puzzled about their enemy's intentions. She then inquires about the situation elsewhere, and the lady responds that it's basically safe, except for the heavy losses suffered by the team in the south of the city, with the current situation unknown. Remembering that the south of the city is where Zhu is in charge, she suggests that they should go there to investigate. Meanwhile, someone is looking at the man who was pierced and killed. Duan wonders if all the man's belongings have been taken. Suddenly, Quang Lan appears and orders Duan not to move. She then questions his identity. Duan shows his badge, indicating he is a member of the Cloud Realm, and assures her not to be nervous. She recognizes the badge and acknowledges that he belongs to the unofficial organization composed entirely of fighters, which he confirms. She mentions that she's heard they always act in secrecy and asks why he was there. Duan explains that the dead man was originally a member of their group but betrayed the organization and assisted the realm in invading reality, leading to a monster assault on their camp and resulting in many casualties except for a few survivors. The lady questions if this incident is similar to the recent events and wonders if the realm invasion stopped because the man died. Duan counters with a question about whether they killed the man. She responds that they didn't and are unaware of who did. Duan mentions that the man liked to hide in realm space, highlighting his cunning nature and his own failed attempts to find him. Reflecting on the situation, Quang Lan realizes that despite Zhu's strength, the entire army was wiped out, suggesting that directly killing the enemy stopped the realm invasion. This revelation leads Quang Lan and Duan to speculate whether there exists such a formidable figure in Qin Yu City. Duan then walks away, prompting her to ask where he is going, to which he replies that he is off to find something. Meanwhile, in Ning Feng's home, he was shouting with happiness upon discovering that the man's drop actually included two pieces of orange set equipment for the fighter profession. They are Eternal Glory, a top set accessory of orange quality with a level requirement of 120, and then Eternal Glory Pants, another set accessory of orange quality, also requiring level 120. However, he remembered that the man wasn't wearing them, leading him to guess that it was probably because the man's level wasn't high enough. 
he knew that if the man had warned them, he would have had to use forbidden techniques to defeat the man. He then stares at the man's pendant, noting its strange appearance, lack of quality, and unknown information. Flicking the pendant, he hoped there was no ancient god hidden inside of it. The pendant didn't move, but using the pendant, the demon was watching him. The demon, glad that he reacted quickly and closed the realm, hoped he hadn't been discovered. When Ning Feng stared at the pendant and expressed his hope that no ancient god was hidden inside, the demon jumped in shock and panically ordered his demons to cut off all their contacts and not to expose their location hastily, which the monsters quickly followed. The demon sighed with relief, thinking it was close and admitting it scared him to death. He also wondered how Ning Feng sensed him. The next day, in the city hospital, Zhu lay on the hospital bed, covered in bandages, and told Quang Lan that it was the young fighter who had saved them. He recounted how, as soon as the enemy saw the young fighter, they immediately opened a rift in the realm and escaped. She agreed, telling Zhu that she could vaguely feel that Duan's strength was comparable to hers. The man pondered whether the man, who had evaded capture by even the strongest, had actually been taken down by a mysterious figure. She speculated that it seemed to be the case for now. She then mused that perhaps the mysterious man was just passing by or maybe he was in seclusion. In any case, this mysterious figure definitely wasn't registered anywhere, and aside from some traces of ordinary magic, there were no special findings on the battlefield. Zhu expressed relief at the thought of the mysterious figure living among them, feeling very safe at the prospect. The man then shared his exaggerated idea, wondering if remnants of dark power remained on the battlefield from the previous night. She confirmed his suspicions, explaining that their enemies were monsters from another realm. The man admitted his confusion, merely guessing about the situation, and speculated whether the mysterious figure could also be a mutant. He noted that the two devastating spells hadn't caused any casualties and pondered if the mysterious figure could be a mutant. Zhu dismissed the thought as impossible and an overreach, but Quang Lan took the suggestion seriously. Meanwhile, at the border, Ning Feng announced his intention to undertake the job change task and inquired whether he could pass through. The men allowed him to pass, and he saw the Temple of Radiance. As he started walking toward the temple, he was unaware that someone was following him. It was Duan, trying to investigate him. A few days ago, at the exchange, the lady informed Wang that Duan had come to see him. Wang greeted Duan and told him that he had heard Duan wanted to buy a set of four transferred fighter suits. The lady thought to herself that with such a high level and handsome man as Duan, who was generous with his money, they wouldn't have to worry in the future if they could get Duan on board. Wang then mentioned to Duan that, coincidentally, they had an old customer who had just called and was ready to sell a four transfer fighter suit. But this old customer only had two pieces at the moment, a top and a pair of pants. Duan inquired about the whereabouts of this old customer, to which Wang replied that the customer had some engagements today and couldn't make it. However, Duan noted that the details about the four transfers, two pieces, a top, and pants all matched key information about his master's relic. Although it hadn't been confirmed firsthand, the suit mentioned was most likely his master's. Duan asked Wang if he could tell him where his old customer was and said he could pay for the information, which surprised Wang. Wang wondered about the coincidence, remembering that just as Ning Feng said he was going to sell the suit, Duan showed up asking about it, as if it had been planned. Wang then recalled that his old customer had mentioned going to a neighboring city for some business and suggested he should call to confirm. Later, Wang inquired if Duan had already left, and the lady confirmed she had seen him off. She then asked if something was wrong, and Wang shared that he had someone investigate Ning Feng's background previously. It was discovered that Ning Feng's parents, both ordinary two-star professionals, had disappeared in an accident when Ning Feng was young, leaving Ning Feng alone. Ning Feng had attended the seventh middle school in the city and awakened at 18 but he was only a one-star professional. Upon hearing this, the lady was surprised and told Wang that she thought Ning Feng was impressive, but it turns out that Ning Feng was so unremarkable. She mused that she had always thought there was something off about Ning Feng, looking so poor, but now it was exposed. She then questioned where Ning Feng had acquired the items he sold at their trading post, given that a one-star professional couldn't obtain such valuable items. Wang replied that this was the problem and although Ning Feng was friends with the daughter of the Wang family group, the Wang family group hadn't helped him much. The lady noted that Duan seemed very unhappy earlier, and asked Wang if Ning Feng's suit could have been stolen. Wang responded that it might not have been stolen, but it was probably not obtained through legitimate means, and this time, Ning Feng seems to have provoked someone he shouldn't have. The lady excitedly replied that a four-transfer expert is a top figure even in Baishan province and concluded that Ning Feng's items must have been stolen, which piqued her interest in Ning Feng. Back at the Temple of Radiance, Duan was hiding behind a rock, silently following Ning Feng. 
he couldn't believe that such a young person could repel the invasion of the realm, especially considering that even a strong person like his master was defeated by the realm's boss. Duan then jumped behind another rock to continue his surveillance, pondering that according to the information he had, his master's relic might be in Ning Feng's possession. If Ning Feng wasn't the formidable one, then it must be someone supporting Ning Feng from behind. However, Duan understood the importance of caution, which is why he chose to remain hidden. Upon arriving at the Temple of Radiance's entrance, Ning Feng observed adventurers battling monsters. Duan noticed Ning Feng changing his outfit and believed that by assessing Ning Feng's equipment, he could roughly gauge Ning Feng's strength. After completing his outfit change, Ning Feng appeared exceedingly ordinary, resembling a student who hadn't yet graduated. This left Duan wondering if it was some kind of disguise. He convinced himself that it must indeed be a disguise because given Ning Feng's age, a novice disguise wouldn't attract attention and would allow him to blend into the crowd easily. Duan thought that if Ning Feng was intentionally hiding his whereabouts, he might lose his trail. To avoid raising suspicion, he decided not to follow too closely. Duan then marked Ning Feng with his skill to be safe, activating his spirit ritual sensing which marks the target in his consciousness without alerting Ning Feng. As he followed Ning Feng into the temple, Duan observed the monsters in the realm weren't very high level, leading him to wonder about Ning Feng's purpose there. Suddenly, Ning Feng seemed to sense something approaching and swiftly shielded himself from an attacking monster. Duan was shocked, realizing that Ning Feng had deployed an absolute defense that couldn't be breached, no matter the attack. Duan then noticed the monsters were avoiding Ning Feng, affirming his suspicion that Ning Feng was no ordinary individual. When Ning Feng halted, Duan wondered if the towering figure before them was the final boss and if Ning Feng would engage in a one-on-one -on -one battle. He silently exclaimed at the convenience of having no one else around. Observing the boss, Duan was puzzled by why someone as strong as Ning Feng would battle such a low-level boss. It was strange, especially since the statue didn't move at all. Ning Feng surveyed the area, noting the mission guide made no mention of the huge statue, which was trembling with fear, trying hard to remain still. He entered the room and loudly declared that it should be there. Then, he observed a colossal statue, an angel, floating in the sky. The faceless boss revealed its glowing eyes and flew away, leaving Ning Feng astonished. He looked up, questioning why it fled, while Duan, hidden behind him, wondered in shock if it could be a rare hidden boss and how Ning Feng had come to know about it. The system informed Ning Feng that his mission was the all-series mage first turn mission. The prerequisites were to enter the Realm of Glory Temple, obtain the mission item, the Holy Emblem, and defeat the temple's hidden boss, the Six-Winged Angel. Ning Feng smiled as he approached the angel, satisfied that it was truly an S-rank mission, and pondered who could handle it if it were an average first turn. The angel, proclaiming its fear, shouted that it was too scary and questioned where else it could flee within its own realm. As it hurriedly tried to fly away, a formidable thunderstorm gathered above the temple. Despite its fear, the angel didn't hesitate to ascend, attempting to escape Ning Feng's presence. Ning Feng raised his open palm upwards, activating his thunderfall descent skill, which could summon a massive thunderstorm, calling down the power of the heavens. A huge eye materialized in the sky, unleashing a powerful thunderbolt that struck the fleeing angel, causing it to slowly descend disintegrate into ashes. The thunder also turned the temple into ash, and Duan was on the ground, fearing what he had witnessed. Duan couldn't believe it because he had never seen that kind of world-destroying magic before. Duan knew that the strength of Ning Feng was definitely above his masters, making him wonder if Ning Feng could be the rumored eight-turn powerhouse. On the other hand, Ning Feng sighed, thinking that before completing the first turn, his level couldn't increase any further. He noticed that he had accumulated many experience points, which were simply a waste to him. However, he decided to forget about it because, with the emblem in his hand, he would go back and complete the mission. The emblem was the holy emblem, consumable, of orange quality, and it could permanently increase spiritual attributes by 8 and the recovery effect by 100%. He then took out his teleport scroll to go back, but Duan rushed to him and called him Big Shot to tell him to wait a moment. He was stunned in horror upon hearing Duan and wondered when Duan had come and if he had seen it. Duan noticed that Ning Feng's expression looked very unhappy, so Duan told him not to be angry and that he could explain. Then they heard a loud noise, and Ning Feng noticed that it was the alarm. So, he told Duan that they should leave there first, and they could talk outside, to which Duan replied that he got it. When they were out of the Temple of Radiance and settled in a quiet place, Ning Feng asked Duan if he meant he had been following him all that way. Duan apologized to him and explained that he didn't mean anything else because he just wanted to confirm. After all, Ning Feng looked very young, and if Duan hadn't seen it with his own eyes, he wouldn't have believed it. Duan then told him that even though his master, as strong as he was, had paid with his life back then, his master could only temporarily seal the invading realm and let that traitor escape. Over the years, that traitor had been using humans as sacrificial offerings, trying to break the seal, and Duan had been chasing that man for a long time. 
but without success. Ning Feng knew that Duan was a fourth turn powerhouse and thought that if Duan hadn't revealed himself, he wouldn't have noticed at all. But he knew that in the end, it was because his level was too low, and at that rate, exposure was just a matter of time. Duan was in horror when he noticed that Ning Feng suddenly fell silent and wondered if Ning Feng could be planning to silence him to cover his tracks. Duan then told him that he really appreciated him avenging his master, so if he ever needed anything in the future, he should let him know. Ning Feng knew that Duan's level was not low and Duan was a lone wolf, so if he could establish a good relationship with Duan, he guessed it would be useful. He then told Duan that he didn't want anyone else besides him to know about today's matter, and Duan confidently replied that he could rest assured that he would keep that secret. Duan knows that Ning Feng's magic carries a strong dark power, but it does not harm the innocent. Moreover, Ning Feng repelled the realm invasion and saved the entire city. So, no matter the reason, Duan knows that Ning Feng deserves his respect. They then walk to leave, with Duan looking at Ning Feng and deciding to settle down in Kinyu City since he has nowhere else to go. Suddenly, his phone rang, and when he answered it, it was his teacher, Kai Wai. Kai Wai asked him where he was and if he needed anything because she was out of town and getting ready to come back. She also tells him that there is something she'd like to ask him about and they can talk when she gets back. He agreed and ended the call, wondering why Kai Wai suddenly called him. Meanwhile, in some rooms, Quang Lian asks Kai Wai how it went, and Kai Wai replies that from the tone of the conversation, it doesn't seem like there is anything wrong and Ning Feng is already preparing to come back. Quang Lan tells her that Ning Feng, a student who just awakened a few days ago, suddenly reached the level of the first turn, and if it wasn't for the timely investigation, it might have been overlooked. She tells Quang Lan that Ning Feng has a good character and studies diligently, so she believes Ning Feng is not a bad person. Quang Lan tells her that she didn't say Ning Feng was a bad person, but some things need to be clarified. Later, in the meeting room, a man tells everyone that the preliminary situation is as it is, and they will continue to follow up, but they also hope to attract the attention of the superiors. An old man asks if there is anything else, which Quang Lan nods to and asks everyone if it is possible that the two destructive spells in Kin Yu City were caused by mutants. The three men become silent for a moment, and the old man asks her how she could ask such a question if she is a mutant herself. The old man explained to her that mutants use dark power and the brain needs to bear corresponding costs. The more powerful the mutant, the greater the costs they bear, making them consume their life, lose sanity, and even turn into new monsters themselves. The old man also tells her that even the most ordinary costs, if one is not careful, can lead a mutant to an irrecoverable end, and a mutant is equivalent to a king-level threat that simply cannot exist. The man called her his old classmate and told her that she was getting more and more confused. He also told her that he admired her imagination regarding the king-level mutant and that if she liked making up stories so much, she might as well become a screenwriter. However, she responded that she was just considering all possibilities, so whether he listens or not was up to him. The man, clearly annoyed, told her that she was still trying to argue and that they were just incompetent and couldn't find out anything. Laughingly, the man then told her that if there really was a king-level mutant, he'd cut his head off and let her use it as a ball to kick. The old man cleared his throat to stop them and told her that they had already sent an investigation team to Kinyu City. He hoped she could cooperate actively and, in necessary circumstances, the investigation team would take over all her work. The old man also told her that her request for Lonely Shadow to increase manpower had not been approved. She angrily asked the old man if it was a lack of trust in her, but the old man replied that it was not a lack of trust and begged her to bear with them a little longer. After the meeting, she stretched her hand to relax a little, but then a lady barged into the meeting room in a rush and reported to her that the Realm Temple of Radiance in Longbow City had been attacked by destructive magic, but there were no casualties for the time being. Kai Wai, panicky, tells them that when Ning Feng was registering his training location during the investigation, it was. But Quang Lan cut her off by telling her that it was right that he registered in the Temple of Radiance. Quang Lan then smiled and said that the situation was getting interesting. Meanwhile, Longbo City was enveloped by a barrier, leaving everyone inside wondering what exactly happened over at the Radiant Sun Temple. A man assured everyone not to worry because the barriers had been raised to the highest level, which would isolate the dark forces from the outside and not affect the downtown area, making everyone believe that it should be safe. He was frustrated that the commotion they caused earlier had triggered the highest alert directly, and they'd just have to wait for the alert to be lifted before taking the car back home. But then, a crack appeared in the sky inside the barrier, and a monster peeked out from it, slowly emerging. The huge monster noticed a magic barrier in front of them and questioned why it was being opened but decided to dismiss it, thinking humans are so fragile for always hiding behind their turtle shells. A swarm of monsters then came out of the crack, with the leader teasingly saying that it was too bad for the humans because those things couldn't stop them anymore. The monster leader then pointed to the barrier and ordered his monster minions to attack. 
The barrier allowed the minions a way to fly through, leaving everyone confused. The man who had been reassuring the people looked up, wondering what those creatures were, and they were all shocked to realize that they were monsters. A guard, panicked, asked why monsters were breaking through the barrier, but the man noticed that the barrier wasn't damaged, making them wonder how the monsters got in. The people pushed back in fear, but Duan calmly created a shield to protect himself and others. Duan called him boss to suggest that this might be another high-intensity realm invasion. He asked Duan if he was right that it was similar to what happened in Kingu City the previous night, but Duan asked him back if they should intervene. He asked Duan if he had a solution, and when Duan was about to respond, he stopped, knowing that he could easily handle it and wondered why he was asking him for a solution. Then, Duan thought there was no way he was actually asking what he was thinking. He was clearly testing him. Duan then stretched his neck while telling him that he understands and he should leave it to him, leaving him confused. But he realized that there were so many people around, and it was not convenient for him to intervene, so he thought he should let Duan handle it and replied, Okay. The leader monster landed on the ground, shocking everyone. The monster teasingly laughed as one of the guards released his arrows while shouting that the leader monster was dead. However, the leader monster easily blocked them with his sword. Another guard appeared behind the leader monster to attack. But with a swift backswing of his sword, the leader monster instantly killed the guard. In horror, the guard questioned how it was possible, shouting that they couldn't even touch him. The leader monster, piercing his sword into the ground and dragging it as he walked, expressed disappointment, thinking there would be some strong humans to challenge him. The people ran away upon noticing the monster heading their way. The leader demon raised his sword, aiming it down at the people while deeming them all rubbish. Then, suddenly, someone blocked his sword, and the leader monster was shocked to see it was just one person holding a dagger. Initially confused, Duan told him that although his boss didn't really need his protection, since he was there, he couldn't let his boss get personally involved. He then calls Ning Feng boss again, saying that he'd take care of it, prompting Ning Feng to ask Duan if he could stop calling him boss because it felt a bit embarrassing. The leader monster laughed, conceding that not all humans were worthless after all. But Duan, pushing the leader monster sword, sending the leader monster away, slightly damaging him. Before the monster could regain his composure, he was shocked to find Duan in front of him with daggers. Duan then easily slashed the leader monster into pieces within seconds, leaving the onlookers in disbelief. They questioned the level of Duan's strength, as the monster stood no chance, and exclaimed that Duan possessed considerable skills, likely indicative of a high star hidden class. Duan walked back to Ning Feng while the leader monster exploded into pieces behind him. Duan, a level 137 legendary martial artist, represents a 5-star hidden class. Ning Feng, incredibly amazed by Duan's combat prowess, calmly informed Duan that there was something else there. The monsters rushed back to the portal, realizing that their leader was killed, and the archers began to strike back, now confident they could handle the smaller monsters. Duan asked him if he needed to do anything else, but he just gave Duan a thumbs up and told him that he had done great. The people couldn't believe that a formidable fighter like Duan showed such respect to a young man, making them wonder how powerful the young man was and if he could be the son of some prominent family, traveling with guards for experience. Duan then showed the loot dropped by the leader monster and gave it to him. The people exclaimed that even if he couldn't use them himself, they were worth tens of thousands of crystals each, and the ladies lovingly asked Duan if he needed a maid to serve him. He saw that one item was a big golden charm named Chasing Red, which he thought was an agility skill book perfect for Wang Yu. The other item was Dark Shield, and he told Duan that they would sell the shield for money later. A warrior, being helped by a priest, called them two mighty warriors and asked if they could have a word with them, which they agreed to. A moment later, the mayor of the city respectfully thanked them for intervening and saving Longbow City. The man then introduced himself as Kai Dongming, the mayor of Longbow City, and noted that they seemed unfamiliar and not like locals. He replied that they were originally there on business but had been stuck there and couldn't leave for now. He then inquired if Kai Dongming had any idea why they were there. Kai Dongming, visibly afraid, replied no and asked if it was because they had triggered the highest alert. Kai Dongaming then apologized, admitting that it was their fault for causing such inconvenience. He quickly clarified that it was not their fault, knowing he was the one who had caused it. Kai Dongaming then ordered his man to fetch the flight scroll they had just bought and offered it as an apology, which the man agrees to. He was surprised upon hearing this, knowing that the flight scroll was a rare find in those parts, and although it was single use, it made short distance travel convenient and fast. Kai Dongaming mentioned they had an unpleasant request due to the chaos lately and asked if they could stay in Longbow City for for a few days because, as they saw, their defense forces were indeed a bit thin. He apologized to Kai Dongaming, explaining that his schedule was tight and he might not be able to fulfill his request. The truth was his class transformation only had three days left, 
and if delayed, the first transformation would never be completed. He then asked Kai Dongming if he thought he was very idle, making Kai Dongming fearfully reply that it was their oversight. The man then handed Kai Dongming the scroll he wanted and offered him the supreme black card from the Yuan Cheng trading post as a small token of appreciation. He was shocked upon seeing it, having heard that the supreme black card from the Yuan Cheng trading post is only given to a select few successful individuals, granting various privileges. This made him realize why Kai Dongming could afford a flight scroll and guess that Kai Dongming's status must be extraordinary. Duan grabbed the gift and thanked Kai Dongming with a smile. The mayor expressed his hope for them to just accept it, otherwise, he was really worried about being blamed. He asked if they could seek help from them if Longbow City encountered danger in the future. He replied that there was no problem with that, as long as he had the time, making everyone cheer, believing that Longbow City was now safe. They then used the flight scroll and happily enjoyed their fast flight. Meanwhile, in King Yu City, at the class transfer hall, the cleric happily announced to them that Wang Yu had emerged. Chang and Wang Yu then came out of the hall, but she looked up when she felt something coming and saw purple and green lights fly past them at full speed. Chang asked her what was wrong, and she replied that she just saw two people flying by, guessing one of them seemed to be Ning Feng. Cheng, skeptical, remarked that the flight scroll costs thousands of crystals, which a poor guy like Ning Feng couldn't afford. He also questioned what Ning Feng was doing at the class transfer hall since he had just awakened. She sternly warned Cheng that if he ever spoke ill of Ning Feng again, she would make him regret it. Cheng stepped back in fear, wondering why he always brought up a worthless loser, and what was wrong with him compared to Ning Feng. The cleric then diverted their attention by inquiring about her second transformation tasks. Cheng proudly stated his was a grade, lamenting he didn't achieve an S grade. The berserker man reassured Cheng that an A grade was already commendable and only the luckiest could get an S grade. The mage man added that completing a second transformation at 18 was already an achievement coveted by top universities, and A grade tasks were rare opportunities. The cleric then turned to Wang Yu, who silently looked down, prompting a pause from the group. The cleric noted Wang Yu's strange expression and speculated if she had drawn a task below C rank. Chen smugly thought that even the praised genius girl has her off days, as the task level directly affects attribute bonuses and skill unlocks. Chen consoled her not to be too upset and to just work hard to catch up in the future, offering his help if she fell behind with a C grade task, thinking it was quite a setback. She angrily informed Cheng that she was not upset about an A grade, so she wouldn't be upset about an S grade, leaving her whole team shocked. The cleric asked her why she hadn't said so earlier, and she replied that it was because her situation seemed different from others, revealing her task had unlocked a hidden class never seen before. Well guys, that's the end of the video. If you like this video comment part 2 in the comment section. Also subscribe to the channel, hit the bell and like the video. Thank you for watching and see you next time again.